There really isn't that many people um, talking about the history of dyspraxia. I've actually found this one of the more harder ones to research. So it's actually been quite exciting on that. I'm Nat and I am head of community at Exceptional Individuals. For those of you who have not heard of us, we support neurodiverse individuals. So anyone with like dyslexia, dyspraxia, autism, ADHD, dyscalculia, dysgraphia, all the disses. And the main reason we do it is because 80% of our team are neurodiverse and we understand the challenges, but more importantly, the strengths firsthand. So our goal is to upskill those who resonate and educate employers and organizations and governments to recognize us for however we are on the spectrum. So Ginny, there are not captions on this, unfortunately, but on our YouTube videos, we do re-edit the automatic captions. So that's something you'll be able to look back on. Great. Oh, we've also got, oh, Rodder from Aberdeen and have two pupils with dyspraxia, percussion lesson for eight years each, and both are now primary school teachers and have been in tough, regular, just really interested. I teach quite a lot of pupils with autism too, amazing. Well, that's the thing, I've got dyspraxia. I was diagnosed, I think I was about three when I was diagnosed with it. And most people are diagnosed at quite a young age. There is, however, an unfortunately, a disproportionate amount of diagnosis for white middle class. Now, if for other people, it typically get picked up at, in primary school, if you're lucky to get picked up. It's a bit more difficult to get diagnosed in later life for a number of reasons, mostly because it is less known than those such as dyslexia, so is normally misdiagnosed. Today, we're not going into the details of what makes a diagnosis, but kind of how do we get to where we are today? Because it's a long, complicated history. And if I was to summarize the history of dyspraxia in like a really short sentence, it would be identity crisis. It's continuously changing its name. It doesn't know what it is, what it isn't. It's been mentioned and thrown about and there's still a lot of blurriness. So today we're gonna try and hit home on the things that we know to be true. But if there's any other things that I have men not mentioned, let me know. Oh, Victoria says, I was diagnosed when I was 19 at uni after getting into a total flap having to do quantitative analysis after barely scraping standard gray GCSEs. Well, good on you for that. That sounds hard. Both my pupils are teenagers before they were diagnosed. Great. So as I mentioned, we are a neurodiverse team based in the UK, open to everyone as a social enterprise. We work with organisations and that allows us to fund our community efforts. So everything that we offer to you as an individual is always free. So feel free to get in touch if you have any questions, concerns about yourself, about your children. We specialise in those who are of working age, but we still have a fair enough knowledge on the uh, younger ones as well. Oh, Soul Master says, I don't know if I have it, but I do struggle with basic math skills. And you know what? Neurodiversity is, it is a big old spectrum and things blur all over and you've got co-occurring conditions, which if you have autism, autism is really closely linked to dyspraxia, but also really closely linked to ADHD. So sometimes the line isn't so straightforward. Maths, for example, could be dyscalculia, but it also doesn't have to be. And we'll go in a bit more detail soon about how the history of dyspraxia is very closely aligned with dyslexia as well as autism and ADHD. Some things, if you came to the one the other week about dyslexia, you'll notice are very similar, but there's also some areas which are very different. Okay, now this is a bit, I do it every presentation, but I like to really describe or define what I mean by neurodiverse because we're gonna be talking about the history of dyspraxia, but maybe not focusing as much on current day. And for me, it's the fluctuation of ability. So this is how dyslexia, dyspraxia, autism, ADHD are all aligned yet different. They all have things where you can be exceptionally great at, maybe even above the average, but there's also things which are deficits, things that you find harder or struggle with. So it's more about like the fluctuation. And this is why when we talk about the positives, we're not 
dismissing the struggles, but it's also understanding that for you to have any of these, you have to have highs and lows. Solmaz says, there was a part in a video game I like in which the enemy had a part in which it did prime numbers and had to guess the answer. And if you failed, you got hit. I got hit every time. <laughs> Ouch. I feel you on that. So now, dyspraxia, a brief history. And I'm going to be calling it dyspraxia today, but you'll find out as we go on, is it even called dyspraxia or is that the politically correct term? In the US, not so much. In the UK, it's still the most common. But there's still a lot of blurriness. But it is really interesting. So to start off with, dyspraxia potentially could be known for over 100 years. Now, it's quoted as clear who first mentioned the term. Now, if you look online, very, very, you know, spotty in terms of direct you know, find a, a real quote. It was a magazine that ran like about 100 years ago. They mentioned cognigenital malarodness. Hopefully you can read the screen far better than I can pronounce it. But this is when the first kind of what they were talking about aligns very closely with dyspraxia. But this was just kind of like passed around. You know, this is like the very, very earliest stage before anyone even thought of being clumsy, disorientated, having motor deficits or, you know, neurodiversity, any of this stuff. Okay, here's a cat. I always think it's really good to make this feel a little bit more human to understand. This isn't some rare condition that we got like hidden in the back of the closet. It's really common. So if you are dyspraxic, when were you diagnosed? Or if you're not dyspraxic, but you work with people, how old were they when they were diagnosed? Because I think a lot of the time we think about children, developmental learning, you know, conditions. But actually, you know, as we're looking at here, a lot of, you know, 30, 30, 40. Oh, happy birthday to your son, who's almost six, three, I said I was about three or four, 19, diagnosed four, I don't have dyspraxia. So as you can see, it really is so diverse. Anyone can be diagnosed at any age, but it is primarily really a lifelong condition, something you are born with and potentially one day will die with. But this is why the term dyspraxia gets a little bit interesting because dyspraxia is like a term it doesn't necessarily refer to the dyspraxia that we're talking about there like neurodiversity side dyspraxic drama uk nice i don't have a diagnosis of dyspraxia but i was diagnosed with autism when i was four thanks april they are very closely aligned though and hopefully this screen will give you a bit of understanding for those that are that it, it is common but if you are over 30 the likelihood of you being diagnosed earlier on in life, it is very slim, just because there was a lack of understanding, a lack of awareness, and only now people are starting to get the conversation really started. And only now are people starting to understand the differences between dyslexia and dyspraxia. Yeah, they sound the same. Yeah, there are some similarities, but they are quite different. In many ways, I'd say it's more closely aligned to autism than it is dyslexia. But as mentioned, you know, they all interlink. OK, now we're moving into the 1920s, the roaring 20s. Or was it 30s? Motor weakness. We still haven't called it dyspraxia yet. People aren't sure, but they know that there's a weakness in motor. And what do we mean by that? Well, motor is, you know, us like moving around, our coordination. It can even be about speech. Anything where the brain has to tell some of your body to do something. So this is why when some people struggle with speech and also like dancing or riding or doing up buttons, all of it counts as motor skills. I always found this term a bit confusing. I was like, I'm not a car, but they just, you know, like operations. I think it was two. There was a French doctor and therapist um, calling attention to motor awkwardness in many disabled children. Bear in mind, children at this stage, we still haven't observed it in adults. And even at this stage, 
when we say children, they were actually meaning boys. It, it wasn't really, you know, neurodiversity and women was a thing. Same with autism, dyslexia, dyspraxia. And obviously we know it is a thing. But, you know, it's just because the way it was demonstrated, very different. And thus the way of diagnosing someone or observing someone was created from a male point of view. So always bear that in mind when you're looking at the diagnosis or symptoms or and think who created it, you know, what were they looking for? Because sometimes there is a bit of a disconnect. It was also called motor weakness or psychomotor syndrome. Not as catchy to be honest as dyspraxia, but you get the idea. It's starting to be talked about but there's a lot of people doing a lot of research and no one has kind of decided what we're going to call it. What other names have you heard for dyspraxia or dyspraxics in the past? Hopefully they're not too mean, but you know, any names which you have heard that relate to dyspraxia or maybe you've called yourself or been called in the past. So we've got DCD, Development Coordination Disorder, Clumsiness, Unfortunately, we'll get on to clumsiness that unfortunately spread like wildfire in terms of how people define it. Clumsy child syndrome, again, really reinforcing the myth that it's only for children. Nope. Or it develops in childhood. Nope. It's all around us. Cack-handed. Yes. My mum actually uh, <laughs> calls me that quite a lot. I'm a bit cack-handed. I never really got what that meant. I'm kind of ambidextrous, you know, when you use our left and right. I think people with dyspraxia are more likely to be left-handed, which is interesting. So we're keeping with those ones, which are interesting. There really are so many more names. And this is why when it comes to diagnosing with dyspraxia, a lot of people get quite confused because you probably will not be diagnosed with dyspraxia because medical professionals call it DCD, development coordination disorder and the reason why that is the preferred term is simply because dyspraxia can be something you can acquire it can be about you know clumbiness coordination motor neuron and if someone says oh you got dyspraxia it really could mean a lot of things and a lot of different things so by calling it dcd you're essentially saying this is what it is. It refers to neurodiversity, neurodivergent, how your brain processes information, that no gray areas, this is what we're picking. But colloquially, so like commonly, dyspraxia is what you know most people in the community call it. But it is important to know the difference. Here are just a few others, and I mean a few, there really were so many other potential ones. So as I said, the most common is developmental coordination disorder. However, there is a movement calling it developmental coordination condition, DCC. At the moment, that's just a bunch of passionate people. Not many medical professionals are calling that, though. Developmental apraxia, that's also fairly common. Disorder of attention and motor perception. This is a really interesting one. Damp. Yes, Jen, I love damp. <laughs> Sorry. Damp. Have anyone ever heard of that? So damp is a very unfortunate acronym. And what it basically means is if you've got ADHD and dyspraxia, like co-occurring, it normally gets put under the, the title damp. Now, the reason why that's a little bit problematic is say you've, you're already feeling self-conscious about yourself. You know, you, you've had to go to a doctor or a medical profession and say, I, my brain, you know, I need help. Something's not going as I plan. And someone says, it's fine. You know what? You're damp. You're probably not going to feel empowered. So this is why maybe do not use damp even though, just so you understand, it refers to someone who has a lot of the qualities of ADHD and dyspraxia. Then we've got developmental dyspraxia. Developmental dyspraxia is the way to really hit home that we're talking about DCD, because developmental is about how your brain learns information, a learning condition, but there's also like physical dyspraxia, which similar kind of output but the way that the brain gets to those challenges is very different 
perceptomotor dysfunction. Interesting. Motor learning difficulties. That's kind of like the umbrella term. And sensimotor dysfunction. The last ones are a little bit more obscure and you're probably not going to hear it. So the most important ones to know is DCD, dyspraxia, and I suppose damp. Could have been a bit more catchy, eh? Ginny says, some people have difficulties with the perception of sound, auditory. So this can mimic auditory perceptions, ADHD, ID, etc. Thank you. All right, now we've got to our first case study. And for those of you who are up to speed on your dyslexia, this guy should hopefully be known. Dr. Samuel Orton, he was a physician, psychologist, you know, neuroscientist. He was all of those things. But essentially, he was a medical professional in learning disabilities, an absolute juggernaut in, the, in pioneering different ways of thinking. What set him apart from other people was when people said disability, everyone thought negative, negative, negative. But he noticed a correlation between everyone that he was witnessing was incredibly intelligent. They had a high IQ and yet their general day to day functioning was like up here. But when it came to reading, writing, communication, it, it, it was a bit quite of a deficit. And those two things didn't make much sense to him. So even as early as the 30s, people were noticing you can have a non a, a disability that doesn't affect your cognitive ability. So in terms of like smartness, to put it bluntly. And this guy, as pioneering as he was, he worked on, he spoke a lot about dyspraxia, but as per normal, didn't mention it by name. So most people think of him just about dyslexia, but if you go into his research, he does talk quite a lot around which anyone who knows about dyspraxia would know that he was relating to that. And he called it one of the six most common developmental disorders. So again, even in the 1930s, people knew dyspraxia was a thing, even if they didn't call it that. They knew it was incredibly common. And yet today, people still don't know what it is. And when you say, oh, how common is dyslexia? They wouldn't, a lot of you might know the statistic on how common dyslexia is or autism, but you probably might not know how common dyspraxia is. And I actually am going to ask you in a moment um, how common you think each one is. That's why I was careful not to spill the beans. Another thing to know before I move on from this chap is that Orton Gilliam is an approach that some of you may have heard about. And it's commonly used for people who struggle with reading and writing. And it was pioneered by Orton in terms of his studying and his research. But then when he passed away, Gillingham, a, another educational expert, language expert, decided to take his teachings and develop it into a curriculum. And it's still really popular today. So I think that's that's nice. Rodera said, one of my pupils was amazing with sticking pattings, drum kits and xylophones. Nice. I think, you know, um, we'll get on to, there's a celebrity who's really good at drumming who uh, has dyspraxia. But again, I'll hold that to a little bit later. So on here, all I need you to do is rank the following. So for example, if you think autism is the most common, that would be number one. If you think ADHD is the least common, that would be number four. Okay, interesting. So we've got currently in the lead is uh, dyslexia, then by a close second, autism, followed up with ADHD, and then dyspraxia. Now, I'm this, I'm going to tell you the answer, and it, as, it isn't actually what a lot of you think. So dyslexia is arguably the most common, and there's a few reasons for that. One, because it is the most common. The second one is it's also the most widely diagnosed in terms of the amount of professionals who are able to diagnose it. So that's something you should always take in consideration if you are looking to get a diagnosis. Have a look at the person's qualifications. What are they trained in diagnosing? Because if they're only diagnosed in di diagnosing dyslexia and not dyspraxia, there's a chance that, you know, you might uh, get a bit of a dodgy diagnosis. I'm not sure how often this happens. It's just something which I think you should consider when doing your research. Now, autism, 
Uh, interesting, interesting. The next second one is dyspraxia. Dyspraxia is roughly about one in 10, as similar as dyslexia. Obviously, these numbers vary depending on what sources you look at, but dyspraxia is nearly, if not just as common as dyslexia, yet no one really knows about it, which I find really interesting. It just didn't get the publicity. The next two are autism and ADHD. They're about one in 100, a conservative estimate. And autism, you know, is kind of like the poster child of neurodiversity. Everyone loves autism <laughs> just because it's, you know, it's the more, let's face it, it's the more interesting one. The others, though, are just as common. And when we talk about neurodiversity, we are talking about all of these. But originally it was kind of created for autism in order to be like a more positive like name for it and to refer to the movement about it having advantages not just negatives so hopefully that gives you an idea that dyspraxia is a lot more common than you would ever believe even though you probably might not be diagnosed with it so katie said how effective are adult diagnoses out of 10 that's a hard question to answer. I do know it's easier to be diagnosed with dyspraxia as an adult. There's less criteria, but with children, they do go for a few more criterias. But I think the difficulty lies with the funding. Will you get on in HS? You know, unlikely, though possible. It's most likely going to have to be private. But I, please don't get me wrong. I'm not saying all diagnoses are dodgy. I'm just saying it's important to do your research and understand the person who's conducting it. That's all I'm saying. Okay, here's a quote, and I'll be honest with you, not the most flattering one, but still important to understand in terms of the history. So in the 1940s, Anel, who was an academic medical researcher, said, Awkward in movements, poor at games, hopeless at dancing and gymnastics, a bad writer and effective in concentration. He is in attentive, cannot sit still, leaves his shoelaces unties, does buttons wrongly, bumps into furniture. <laughs> Doesn't that just make you want to cry? Like, that is how people were talking about dyspraxia back then. Still, maybe not having like a proper name, but it was how they were speaking about it. Sounds like my primary school report. Oh, sorry, Victoria. The pain is real. And you know what? Yes, I do resonate with these. I am an awkward dancer, but personally, I think I've got game. I cannot play video games. I love playing them, but I am terrible. You know what? I can't argue that a lot of what they're talking about does resonate with me. But I think what makes it not very accurate today is that it just doesn't highlight any of the positives. If you look at there's a really interesting phrase here. He he is interactive. So they're talking about from a male. And this was a report, which I don't expect any of you to read. It's kind of boring. <laughs> but the report was speaking generally. And yet they used male pronouns. And it still goes back to the fact that we fought ADHD, we fought autism, you know, every, all of these, for some reason, only men could get them or boys. It's, it's only fairly recent, like in, you know, in the last decade or so, where people started to really acknowledge that all genders and all ages are equal when it comes to neurodivergence. All right, we've got another uh, old chap here. So this is covering probably the, the, well, the biggest time gap, just because not much happened um, in the 1940s to 1960s. We had a bit of a lull. There was a, you know, talking was going on, but Arguably, there wasn't much progression in the dyspraxia. Remember, people are talking about dyslexia or autism. There's a lot going on under the surface. Dyspraxia was never the most popular one. And I know it seems weird about talking about neurodiversity from a popularity point of view, but it is true. If something isn't flavor of the month, it's not going to get the amount of research or funding put behind it. But in the 1947, this is when the United States started to talk about it as clumsiness. They didn't call it a clumsy disorder, but they started to say clumsy. So if you look at the reports of Stratus and Lemphium, who are you know pioneers also in the field, they use the word clumsiness quite a lot. And for me, this is the start of a slippery slope of being identified as a klutz for the rest of my life. 
these weren't bad people though it's just to give you an idea when the terminology started to kick in but there really was no documentation on developmental dyspraxia until a series of case studies appeared in the 1960s so remember that in the late 40s we spoke about it but we didn't even bother to name it until the 60s so it says sounds like me when i was younger and with coordination and handwriting skills yeah i know that Ooh, adorable gif of a cat what activities do you find you are most clumsy with we're all clumsy i think the, cl the word clumsy has negative connotations now unfortunately it is kind of syn synonymous with dyspraxia even if it is kind of outdated so we've got ball games yep my face was always a ball magnet okay sports running and walking cooking yep anything that requires motor skills dodging our arrow, arrows Ooh, walking ball games running risk sports sp okay oh vacuuming interesting doing things quickly walk yeah hiking gymnastics oh no no one on the dancing yet i'm always stepping on people's toes or like my um you know if you're playing like rounders or batter like where you've kind of got to catch a ball in the face again i remember uh, in schools it's hilarious actually probably not for that person but i accidentally broke a person's nose because i was throwing a ball and uh, my coordination was so off hit him right in the nose I felt so guilty and oh I was at a wedding a few years back and I had a bat and I went to hit the ball only went and let go of the bat and the bat hit a guy and like knocked a bit of his ear off at a wedding so embarrassing I, I genuinely didn't mean to do it on purpose I just really lack any coordination one task rem okay Katie remembers being assigned was the fingertip touch exercise oh, I don't know that one so yeah, I'm sure we all have countless examples of instances where we made a writer fall of ourself. It happens. Cool, we're now up into the 70s. And we had now in the 70s, this is where the names started to make a bit of progression. We think, you know what? We need com some consensus. So people were chucking the names around like, because you know, people love their name and history. So Jean Arez titled it Disorder of Sensory Integration. Nice name. Didn't really catch on. No one bothers using that anymore. But then Dr. Sasson Gubbery named it Clumsy Child Syndrome. And yet for some reason that stuck. Let's face it, Disorder of Sensory Integration sounds way nicer than Clumsy Child Syndrome. Unfortunately, Clumsy has a bit of a ring to it. It's stuck around. So not only do people think that dyspraxia just means you fall over a lot, they also now think that it's only for children. So though Dr. Uh, Gubbe, Gubbe was a great academic, definitely screwed us over a little bit in the long run. And to define the dyspraxic child as clumsy, whose ability to perform skilled movements is impaired despite normal intelligence and normal findings on the convention neurological exam. So as you can see here again, normal intelligence. It has always been known to, for to individuals to have normal, if not above intelligence. It's never been known as someone for like dumb or low intelligence. And this is one of the crucial things that differs it from dyslexia. Dyslexia isn't low intelligence, but people thought that from the very beginning, where dyspraxia was always more commonly related to like movement. So for instance, you could both have poor handwriting, which also closely relies to a condition called dysgraphia. But remember, it's, it's a spectrum. It's not like you have or you don't have, or you have a little bit, you know, you can't be a little bit OCD. It's, it's, it's a spectrum. Okay, what is the biggest help, in your personal opinion, for those with dyspraxia? So if any of these were to be done, which one do you think would be the biggest help? Jen said to Katie, my mum gave up on teaching me how to tie shoelaces the proper way. I'm 30 sick and still prefer the bunny ear method. I love the bunny ear method. I was all about those Velcro shoes. And admittedly, the ones with the lights on when you like your step and they light up. But that wasn't to do with dyspraxia. Victoria said, when people say they're a little OCD and have no idea what it means, makes my blood boil. 
you and me both, I actually have OCD tendencies and it's horrible. <laughs> you know, I can't lie. You know, I, I'm positive about most things, but OCD is, is difficult. There's another method. April, I use bunny ear methods to tie my shoelaces too. You know, it's in the same, like a, like a bunny, then there's a fox and it goes around a tree. Okay, here we go. So the first one, understanding awareness from others. Yes, education, education, education. You really can't get better than that. Personal understanding of own. Oh, sorry, it says dyslexia. That's my, that's my dyslexia. Right, dyslexia instead of dyspraxia. I really think you can't just rely on other people to have an awareness. If any of you are got children or, you know, Yes, you can complain to the school system, but it really has to be both parties coming together because let's face it, it's different for everyone. So my understanding of it will be different to your understanding and labels helpful a lot of the time where labels are helpful is it gives you a name to something where you can talk about it. But where the real value comes in a label is the word full stop and then you talk about it and you discuss it. So try to kind of remove the connotations and the label like separate, but so labels are helpful to a certain extent. And then you've got to talk personally, you know, we're real people. You can't just pigeonhole everything. Victoria said, I honestly don't know there was another way to do it. Oh yeah, there are many ways to tie shoelaces. A lot of them would be considered not very good. My shoes are continuously falling off my feet, always. I don't know how else I'm going to do it, to be honest. <laughs> All right, 80s. We're in the disco era. Or was that the 70s? I think it was like a transition. But let's face it, the 80s had the best music. And a lot of things were happening in the dyspraxia world. People started talking about it. People are know, you know, this is a thing that people are starting to get interested in, finally. So the word dyspraxia is now being used. Woohoo! 1980s. We finally got a name for it that people are liking. Yes, it's a bit blurry because dyspraxia can mean numerous things, but it's a name that stuck around. And we also started to get rid of clumsy child syndrome. We also had Darwi, who was an academic, questions the mandating of normal intelligence and suggests that child motor skills could be compared to their cognitive skills. So what we're saying here is cognitive skills is the brain processing. Motor skills are like the physical doing. So this person was saying, what is dyspraxia, you know, where, where is it actually coming from? In 87, the Dyspraxia Foundation was founded as a Dyspraxia Trust. So they're the biggest organization on that specializes in dyspraxia. And, you know, I've worked with them a lot, particularly their youth section and lovely organization, really great staff. But that's amazing that even though it was still very difficult to define. People were changing terminology and names left, right and centre. We now had a dedicated centre just for dyspraxia. And amazingly, they're still going today, as well as a whole heap of others. But the real interesting one is finally in the late 80s, so nearly 90s, it was now socially unacceptable to call someone a clumsy child syndrome. I don't know about you, but I was born at the start of the 90s and... I got called clumsy child syndrome throughout. So I think with most things, it takes a time for these terms to die out. Hopefully less people are like even are aware that it used to be called this, but you know, mud sticks. And it's very difficult to kind of get rid of these negative terms. Victoria says, I was born in 1990 and I think there was a lot worse terminology going back around then as well there were but you know I didn't want to really like use all the really negative words you know like I'm not going to mention them but that was the most ex it wasn't that that word was like a slur it was allowed you know doctors would use it and that's the thing I'm saying so it was a negative you know it was factually incorrect and negative terminology uh, connotations but it was still being used by professionals so so that's kind of what I mean Obviously, you know, bullies and jerks, uh, you know, they'll always find more creative words. Jen says, does Spraxia Foundation have some good publications? Absolutely. I, you know, I really would recommend them. They are a charity, so they are limited in what they're able to do. But what they do do well is create really good communities. 
And with that, do you think governments are currently doing enough for dyspraxia? People like Dyspraxia Foundation are doing a lot of like campaigning and advocacy to get it understood. Now, I know not everyone here is in the UK, but just in general in your kind of governments. This, I ask that there's questions that I'm asking now are quite similar to the ones I asked in the dyslexia one because they're not exactly particular to any one of these. And they are a bit of an inflammatory question because whoever thinks that the government are doing enough. It took them so long to even recognise that dyspraxia was a thing or to even talk about it in Parliament. No, not that I've ever heard about. Yeah, you, you never hear about it. They are they do have all party parliamentary groups around neurodiversity and they have done research on neurodiversity, which includes dyspraxia, but it's slow. So, yeah, remember that if you want something to change, you have to talk about it and writing to your MP or whoever represents you, getting it acknowledged, speaking about it, I like confidently is what's going to make a difference and I just always want people to remember that a lot of this change yes academics did push the narrative but unless governments do something with that research not much happens in your personal opinion and this is really personal there is not a right or wrong answer should dyspraxia dcd be classed as a disability do you strongly disagree or strongly agree? Ginny said, was that Boris Johnson or Donald Trump? It was Boris. Yeah, both are questionable depending on who you ask. Okay, interestingly, most of you agree it's a disability. I'd like to say it's a disability because it affects you. It's your facts. It's the way you function. You, you, it's not what they class as a norm. You've got disabilities, you're clumsy, you're bumping into things. You, I, I, I was quite surprised when I found out it's not classes of disability but i just make you think why isn't it and why can't the ccg fund my assessment to get the, uh, an assessment I, i'm confident i've got dyspraxia but the ccg are not able to fight it, fund it. It's, it's, they're not just able to uh, give me an assessment which doesn't help me move forward that's really interesting thanks i'll tell you why it is and why it isn't because this is going to be quite a topical debate it's a disability because Victoria says it can have a detrimental impact on day-to-day -day life. So it puts you at a disadvantage compared to your peers. But it's also could be perceived as not a disability because it's only a disability primarily because of the way that society has grown and developed. And inherently, it doesn't put you at a disadvantage, which is arguable. But that is the argument on some side. I think realistically, it depends on your circumstances, you know, depends like how, how much it affects you in certain areas. It's, you know, it doesn't always have to be like, okay, dyspraxic, mild dyspraxic, heavily dyspraxic. Some days it will affect you more than others. And some days I find it more debilitating. Like say if I'm doing sports, you know, I felt very disabled, but then if I'm just, you know, day to day, minding my own business, I don't consider it a disability. It's just one of those things. So I would say it's a personal decision. But the reason why it's good that it is a disability, at least in the UK law under the Equality Act 2010, is that it does mean that in theory, governments and employers and people should not or cannot discriminate against you. Obviously, I bet you will have a thousand and one examples of when you have been discriminated against. But legally, you, you know, it's a no-no. It's a motor learning disability because it impacts both. Yeah. When it is in conjunction with other neurodiverse conditions too, like ADHD, it can be so difficult to cope with. Yes. And that is the other thing. A lot of the time it is co-occurring. Most neurodivergents are. And with one and the other, it can make it very challenging. But one person's experience isn't the same for everyone. Oriana says, does anyone experience fatigue slash certain weakness slash lack of energy to do normal tasks, being this is something related to dyspraxia? Yeah, I think I do. But, you know, it is very difficult to know what is because of one label and what is because of another label. 
and this is why I typically prefer the term neurodiverse because I think all these things kind of blur and overflow. But yeah, probably. Dyspraxia Foundation. The, in the 1996, the charity Dyspraxia Trust changed its name to Dyspraxia Foundation, and it's what it's known for today. There are many, many organizations for autism and dyslexia, but dyspraxia, not so much, though there are a few. So out of these dyspraxia organizations, which ones have you heard of? So Katie says, not sure how much my poor depth perception is due to my dyspraxia or visual impairment. Okay, so mostly you've all heard of exceptional individuals, which is great. I'd like to think that a few more of you have heard of it. That, that's who we are. Dyspraxia UK. They're quite small. The US one, I wouldn't imagine many of you. And it's nice to see that a few of you have heard of Dyspraxic Me. I'm actually the trustee for that charity. And it's run by a really great woman called Jess. And she created a peer-to-peer -peer support group for 16 to 30 year olds. And every month they do different activities which support people integrate in a friendly environment so they've done things like sports they've done ballet they've done arts and crafts you know education sessions i'm not here to promote it but i would recommend it because i can personally vouch for it all right we're getting to modern day doctor who yes ryan sinclair a human companion of the doctor in the bbc science fiction television program doctor who has the disorder the character deb debuted in 2018 this was a big mark because if you really go looking around the internet for dyspraxic characters, very difficult to find. And a lot of the time they're not named. This was a character who was actually classed as dyspraxic. Yes, they, it was primarily focused around riding a bike, which I thought was a bit of a cliche, but you know what, beggars can't be choosy. You can't, me now. We keep trying this and we'll go on trying till it's done. So today I want to talk about the greatest woman I ever met. Well, there's not much reference in this video, but that's the guy if you've not seen Doctor Who. And a few other ones we got here is Anna mentioned Dyspraxic Fantastic. Yeah, I actually use their resources for um, uh, a few of the research for this, actually. It seems like a great blog. Jessica's trying is trying to be the Bristol local coordinator for Dyspraxia Foundation. Good luck. I was surprised when I saw these episodes. Yeah, I mean, it's it's great that it's kind of getting noticed. And he was a fairly major character. I think he recently left, but really great. But as I did say, there really isn't much representation when it comes to dyspraxia in pop culture and modern media. Now, when I was kind of like scrolling through all like the Tumblr feeds and the Reddits and kind of just trying to find out what are, what do people, who do they resonate with? These were, believe it or not, a few of the characters that people believed have dyspraxia. Now, we can't know for certain, but some of their characteristics or people they like resonated with. Bridget Jones, she's, you know, always stumbling over her words, you know, typically a bit clumsy classic example of someone who could be dyspraxic. Columbo, he, I don't know if, you know, he's a bit um too old for me, but from what I understand, he would always kind of like repeat himself or kind of like, you know, he had a particular way with talking. I think maybe less likely. Neville Longbottom, I could see it myself. And CP Frio, <laughs> he's a robot, but, but I, I kind of do see a lot of similarities. If any of you have any others, do let me know. Incredible Hulk. Interesting. I don't know if that's due to dyspraxia or due to like radioactive poisoning, but I, but I can see it. And sometimes we have to find role models or look in obscure places if we haven't been represented fully before. So these people, I'm not saying were officially meant to be dyspraxic, but they share some qualities that some people in the community have resonated with or saw parts of their personality in. Marshall and Paw Patrol. I have not seen Paw Patrol, but my godson is, was a big fan. <laughs> okay, which celebrity is not known to be dyspraxic? Is it Daniel Radcliffe, David Bailey, 
Clara Devlevine or David Beckham? So which one is not known to be dyspraxic? Nice, David Beckham. Yes, David Beckham has personally resonated with OCD. Daniel Radcliffe, Harry Potter, great example of dyspraxic. David Bailey, an amazing photographer, done a lot of stuff for the royal family. And Cara Devlevine, who is a famous model and is the person who is really great on drums. Okay, question two of two. Who is known to be dyspraxic? So this one, who is dyspraxic? Is it Florence Welsh, the singer? Is it Tom Daly, the swimmer? Will Porter, the actor? Or Ellis Genge, the rugby player? I appreciate I don't know all of these. <laughs> Thanks, April. Appreciate it. Yes, Florence and Florence as a machine is dyspraxic. Will Porter, who was in like Maze Runner as well as a few other things, is dyspraxic. The rugby player is dyspraxic, which is a great example where even sports professionals can still have dyspraxia. Tom Daly, who was at the 2012 Olympics, great at diving, not dyspraxic. Whew, okay, I always find that quite intense. Oh, Jack Sparrow, perhaps, from Pirates of the Caribbean. I like that. That's a really good another one. I could see that in him. And Ginny, thankfully, has posted a link with some other famous dyspraxics. To be honest, there isn't that many because not many people have come forth or probably know. But uh, if you do know any others, do let me know. Uh, Henrietta Lowell, a new leaf from old film Water Manual. Do you know, I did see that when researching it, but I, I never heard of it. So I couldn't pass I couldn't confidently talk about it. OK, well, we don't want to get those two mixed up. He could be both. But yeah, maybe he's just a bit drunk. 2010, the Equality Act, an amazing time in UK politics when all the different disability discrimination acts came together. We're now in principle safe, in principle. But are there any characteristics that you also personally resonate with? So when we say the Equality Act, if you're, you know, someone's discriminating against your age, disability, race, gender, sexual belief, any of these, they all come together in terms of like one bandwagging. Now, interestingly, most people who tend to have one minority characteristic, quality, assignment, you know, whatever you want to call it, do have another one. In principle, but when applying for jobs, it's hard to disclose, absolutely. So interesting, I imagine a lot of people get discriminated against by their gender, their sexual orientation, or just disability in general. It doesn't just have to be physical, it can also be mental. Now for the future. So what does the future hold for dyspraxia? And this is where we're gonna get a little bit controversial, okay? So uh, hold, on to your, hold on to your hats. How far should we go to cure dyspraxia? And this one where you can type your answers. We asked this for the dyslexia one last week, and it was really interesting. And this is by no means I'm advocating that it should be cured or needs to be cured. But it's still a question that as technology advances and technology enhances, should we be talking about it? OK, this is a difficult question. It is. People with dyspraxia should embrace their difference. I like that. Supported assistance technology. So yeah, technology to support you rather than obliterate the characteristics or symptoms. Most people would say that it's something that doesn't need to be cured because it's not a disability, it's society that needs to be cured. And I think personally, that's what I would align with. But I do think if there are technologies or systems or approaches in place which can take the burden or some of the challenges, why not? We should use technology to support the individuals. I can't see there is a cure, but creating strategies, yes. Awareness educates will always be the first steps, then creating opportunities in technology. I like that one a lot. Education by means the first, and then we look to the technology. Embrace your individuality. If you could just cure things that are most debilitating, that'd be great. It's a controversial subject, but it's something which as technology is moving forth, we need to have discussions. And here are a couple really difficult ethic questions. You either say you disagree or agree. If you could have your DNA analyzed for dyspraxia, like a DNA test, 
would you? Would you feel comfortable dyspraxia being seen as a genetic mutation rather than a disorder? Some people are talking about that because they do not like the term disorder, and it's more about just how the body has had mutations over time. It sounds, I think it sounds a bit more negative than it actually is, but, and should parents start screening for dyspraxia in pregnancy? If you could know, would you want to know? Anyone crash into lampposts and trip over their feet with problems and spatial and screen coordination, school mats, pull over. Oh yeah, those mats are always wood. I would have my DNA analyzed, but for different conditions. It's a difficult one. I mean, yeah, you could, it'd be good to know if it runs in your DNA and maybe it's easy, you know, I'd prefer a scientific diagnosis rather than like a personal one. But I don't think I'd want to know if my child was dyspraxic because there's nothing I would do about that. You know, I would still live the good life with them. It's a, it's a controversial subject, but these are just some of the questions which people are beginning to ask. Again, exceptional individuals or myself aren't saying we believe or disagree with any of these. They're just questions which are starting to be discussed. OK, last quick pitch. If any of you are in the UK with dyspraxia and in the workforce, get in touch with us because we might be able to help you out with some funding. But I talk about this every workshop, so hopefully a lot of you will know now. If you haven't, get in touch. And now for some last questions before we wrap up. So Ginny says, neurodevelopment disorders cannot be fixed like mental illness. The society needs to learn to accept and how to acceptance and, and move barriers in a way of positive qualities for all of us. Totally agree. Yeah, so most of you us agree. I like that. Okay, does dyspraxia affect my short-term memory? Absolutely. You know, it's something which happens quite a lot. Sometimes it's not always about forgetting, it's about having the information up there, but the brain is struggling to retrieve it. Sounds quite similar, but there, there is a bit of a difference. Oh, can you get education, health care provisions for dyspraxia? Good question. I'm tempted to say it's meant for autism and ADHD, but I do not know 100%. So I can always get back to you on that or if anyone in the comments can say. Can we make schools more aware and proactive? Absolutely. But bear in mind that in schools, typically they only get one day's worth of training on dyslexia and if they even bother mention dyspraxia, rather than going in there and say, you should know this, go, let's have a talk, let's have a discussion. For me, I found it's far better to start on an individual like teacher to a per basis rather than go after the whole organisation. But we, we definitely can make change, but it's something that we need to talk actively about and to kind of break the stigma attached. I think the difficulty is, is that most schools will, will not get extra funding for dyspraxia, but if they acknowledge it, it is extra work for them. Um, maybe that's me being a bit pessimistic and sceptical, but that would be my initial thoughts. But I do know it's far easier to support someone with dyslexia just because there's more coping mechanisms, strategies and assistive technology that's been created for it. Whereas for dyspraxia, still early days in that field, I'm afraid. OK. Oh, is developmental coordination disorder the most appropriate term? Dyspraxia is not just coordination and whether someone likes motor planning disorder is better. Yes. So DCD is the best term, particularly when you're referring to a medical professional. But do you know what? If you resonate with dyspraxia, call it whatever you want. It's about how you personally resonate. Even if you don't always relate to the some of the characteristics, it will still be called that. For instance, ADHD is still called ADHD, even if you do not always demonstrate the hyperactiveness. Hopefully that helpful. I work with adults as a tutor. What is the best approach? OK, in a nutshell, my best approach I'd recommend is if you have a long question, split it in sections rather than say, can you get the kettle, fill it with water and make a couple of tea? Just say, can you get the kettle? Do that task first, then move on to the second task. Because if you do too many tasks at once, it can kind of overload the brain. So split it up in bite-sized chunks. And if you're writing via email, use bullet points. Okay, I think we're good. Thanks, Nat. Great presentation. Looking forward to starting my coaching with you guys very soon. Yes, thanks, Helen. Oh, I also got a nice message from... Um, Kinga, I imagine that was from you saying how much I was looking forward to it. So thank you. Katie, I was schooled just class as naughty child. <laughs> you and me both. Lunchtime in gym class is a weak, wobbly and roll. Yeah, I would always forget my uh, sports gear. 
educational psychologist to report for zero to 25 year olds. Very informative, nice presentation there, I'll, I'll accept that. So what's next? We've got webinars every single week. Do check them out. And if you have any questions, get in touch. There's an email address. Give us a call if you're in the UK. If you're out of the UK, drop us an email. But it's been absolutely lovely having you all today. And I hope you learned something or, you know, that's the goal at least. All right. So have a lovely day, everyone. And uh, yeah, enjoy yourselves. You too, Nat. Thank you very much. That was excellent. I've oh, got thanks. a lot of pointers for my learners, so brilliant. Yes, that's what I like to hear. Best presentation I've ever heard as well. Really so good. Wow, I'm going to quote that. <laughs> bye bye. All. Oh, bye, Damon. Good to see you again. Yeah. Bye. Cool. Bye, Pete. Bye, Matt. Nice. Bye, Jessica. Well, there's so many names. All right. <laughs> Have a good day. All. Have a good day. <laughs>